Hello, everybody. Welcome to our new YouTube video for uh, CSCI 1250. Uh, in this video, we're going to kind of extend off of what we discussed about classes and objects in class. And I'm going to talk about some things um, related to object-oriented programming, um, such as backing fields, properties, what does static really mean, um, how does this stuff work with memory and variables, and additionally, I'm going to talk a little bit about something called UML, which we will see uh, more of in the future, just to kind of get you a little bit of exposure to it early. So what are our objectives here? Um, and we have Hunk from Resident Evil to help us explain. So we want to understand what a backing field is, um, how do they relate to properties. We want to learn um, why we would sometimes make a field private instead of public. Uh, we want to explore what does the static keyword mean and how do we kind of use that. And we also want to understand reference type data and value type data and sort of what the differences between those things are, um, specifically with how they relate to memory. And we'll look at that here um, in a little while. So the first thing I want to look at is a um, backing field and how it relates to a property. Now, um, Commonly in, in you know, your classes that you'll take and sort of hobby level programming, um, you'll just use a property 99% of the time, at least in my experience. Um, and backing fields are not always something you will manually specify. So I'm going to show you an example here in a second of sort of how you'll do things most of the time. And then I'll, I'll introduce the concept of backing fields in Visual Studio here in a second. But what a backing field is, um, is that essentially lets us store data for something called a property. So um, think about the properties like we saw last week. Those are those public string name, like it says here, but we had that get set thing afterwards. That notation is a property. Um, what a backing field does is it holds the data that a property is accessing. Okay. Um, so what is a property then? A property provides access to the data that these backing fields contain. So think of the backing field as having all the information. Um, and the property is sort of a gatekeeper that allows us to control how that information is read or changed. Uh, by default in C Sharp, and this is kind of what we saw um, in class last week, a backing field is automatically generated by the language itself. Um, every time you create a property. So you just don't see these because C Sharp is making them. The compiler creates them for you. Um, but they are there. They do exist kind of in, in the background. Um, the default get and set accessor bodies. So we're seeing here I have this get, which is says return name. And then I have a set that says name is uh, being assigned some value. right? Um, these are not the default either. So this is kind of a little bit different than what we saw. But I want to show you kind of that this code right here, I want to show you what that looks like with the default implementation that we've already seen. So if we go over here to Visual Studio, I'm going to go ahead and make a class somewhere um, in my project. I want to make a, let's see, what kind of class could we make? Okay, let's do a, um, let's do a video game boss class. So video game boss. And we'll just call this boss um, for sake of conciseness with our code. So like I talked about in class, a lot of this stuff is kind of unnecessary, um, but I want to leave this kind of as basic as we can. So I've got my namespace, which again, this is kind of the solution or the project that I'm working within. And then I have my class header. So it is a public class and it is called boss. So this is going to contain things about video game bosses. Uh, so I'll leave a little comment up here um, that says this class uh, represents a boss from a video game. We're going to make it a little generic. Obviously, different games would have different aspects of bosses that we want to look at, but let's keep it sort of simple here. So what we saw last time, and we'll just look at name, for example. What we saw when we first looked at C Sharp was I had this thing um, that I called an attribute. And if you remember, we could set that equal to some default value if we wanted to, so just an empty string in this case. Uh, but this is a property, right? Um, we know it's a property because it has this get and set um, sort of decorator here. 
um, and it is public, which our properties are usually going to be public. Now, by default, um, which well, we don't really see this, but what's happening behind the scenes is there is a hidden field being created, um, a backing field that is private. It is called name. Uh, the underscore here, if you're curious, is just kind of a naming convention, kind of like in Python, how we use snake case in C sharp. Backing fields that are private, we usually append those or, or start those with an underscore, just so that if we were to glance at this very quickly, underscore name, of course, it's a backing field. You just know by the convention of how it's written. Um, but by default, this is created for us, right? Just by having this line of code present. We don't see it, though, because it's hidden, right? So what we can say is I've got this boss, um, and let's say that, that in my driver program, I create a new one. So I'll say boss, um, we'll do something like this, and we'll say boss.name is assigned a value of, we'll do Melania from Elden Ring. Um, yeah, we'll do Melania from Elden Ring. We'll do her full title. So what this is doing is the property name, right, is setting the value of that hidden field to something, right? And it's setting that value to this string right here. And again, this all happens kind of behind the scenes just by having this present. But if we want to be very explicit in what, what all the different components are, um, like I said, we have some kind of private string in the back end called name. We can even expand how these gets and sets work, right? So by default, we just say the word get and set, um, but they can have some bodies, right? So I can return the value of the field. That's what I mean when I get the value. And when I set the value, I set the field to this new keyword here called value. And what value represents is wherever I'm using this object, wherever I'm using this property, Anything on the right side of the equal sign is my value. So I'm setting, let's do this. So behind the scenes with the property, this is what's happening. So name is assigned value, All right? That's kind of what's happening here. So Melania, goddess of rot in this case is what is being stored in this value. It's kind of a special variable. So this is kind of, if we expand out what the default stuff does, this is sort of what's going on. Now, again, like I said earlier, you could condense all of this down to one line, um, but I wanted to show you sort of what's going on here, um, and we'll talk about why here, here in a little bit. Um, but if we return to our slides, um, hopefully this now kind of starts to make a little bit more sense, right? So the backing field, or the name, is holding the actual data and then the property controls how we look at that data, right? So when I get the value using this property, it returns whatever value the backing field contains. When I change the value using the property, it will change the value of the backing field to some value, right? So who cares, right? Why would we care about private fields? Um, couple reasons. One is encapsulation. This is one of the things we talked about with object-oriented programming. I want to control access to sensitive data. Maybe I have a backing field that I don't want to just throw random numbers into, right? Um, and here's an example of that, and we'll do something a little different with our boss class, but um, one of the ways we can do that is we can and add validation in here, right? So my property setters, so this get and set thing, I can change the sort of default implementation. Like over here, I'm just saying, yeah, name receives some value, wholesale, end of story. Well, what happens if this value is bad and it can't be assigned to name? Well, then your program will just kind of die, right? So one of the things we like to be able to do is control how things are set. So in this example, right, I have a backing field called age. I have a public facing property called age, and notice the convention here is the backing field is underscore and lowercase, and the property is what we call Pascal case, so every word is capitalized. Um, 
But here in the code, forget, I just want to return the value, whatever that value would be. For the set, we can see that this is a little more involved than what we have here, right? Name equals value. This is not just saying age equals value. We first want to check, right? I want to check and make sure that whatever value I'm trying to set my age to is not less than zero, right? You can't have a negative age. So what we can add is an if statement that says if the value would be less than zero, I can throw some kind of exception for that. I mean, there's all kinds of logic you could do here in your program. This is a pretty simple example, though. I can throw an argument exception and provide some kind of custom error message um, that you could use to make your program more robust, right? And then as long as age is not less than zero, I will set age to value. Now, you might be thinking there's several other things we could check for, and you're right, right? I could make sure that age is a number. I could make sure that age is in a certain range. I could make sure that uh, any number of things here, right? Um, but for this example, we're just checking that the age is indeed um, zero or above. So this example here shows encapsulation, right? Nothing can just access the age variable and mess it up and assign invalid data to it and potentially crash my program. Um, why? Because I am using this property to control access to the field itself. Uh, so let's go look at our code here really quick um, before we move on to static. Um, don't really know why the bar at the bottom is there, but that's okay, I guess. Um, there we go. So let's add a second one here, right? So this is a backing fields, these are our properties, right? So let's add a second field called HP. This will represent, um, and I'm going to put a little comment here just so we know what this stuff is, how many hit points the boss has. Um, so these two things kind of describe what the backing fields are going to contain, and then our properties define how access works with those backing fields. So let's add a property for HP. And we know that it's public, we know that it's an integer, and we'll capitalize it as such. So here, um, how do we want this to work? Well, I think the get, I'm okay with just returning the value. Um, so for the get, we can say return the HP value from that backing field. The set, however, I want to make sure that the HP is between 0 and 100,000. That's an arbitrary number that I just made up, but let's just say that we want to have that be our check. So we can check that with an if statement, right? So if the value that I'm trying to set the HP to is less than 0 or the value is greater than 100,000, 100,000, and in C-sharp, we can't use the or word. We have to use the or symbol. So basically, I'm checking if the value is outside of my acceptable range. I want to throw a new argument exception. And we actually have a special exception type for this called argument out of range exception. And we can say the value must be between 0 and 100,000. Could be our error message here. OK, so now we have HP and we have a name. So over in our driver program, we've set the name to something. Let's try to set the HP to 500,000. OK. Now, syntax-wise, this is OK, right? But we said whenever we try to set something to the HP property, we add a check to make sure that I'm not putting anything in that backing field that is below 0 or over 100,000, which 500,000 is. So we should see some kind of error when I run this code. And we'll run this code here. And this is not the prettiest format for YouTube, but we'll do our best. So we see that I have an unhandled exception. I have an argument out of range exception, which is what I wanted the program to throw 
I see a message that says the specified argument was out of the range of valid values. And then down here, I see my special message that I provided that says the value must be between zero and 100,000. So did the program crash? Yes. However, it crashed the way that I wanted it to crash, which is pretty valuable. You can do all kinds of stuff with this that we'll talk about more in some of the other programming classes, but this is a very powerful feature that um, you can do with properties. So let me collapse these down a little bit um, just so that our code remains somewhat clean. Um, and properties and backing fields are both examples of what we talked about in class. Whoa, that's not what I wanted. Um, what we talked about in class, which was attributes, right? We said that data had, oh, this is a disaster. We said that data had attributes and it had actions or methods. So properties and backing fields are both examples of attributes. Okay. So let's go back over to our slides here. And let's look at the static keyword. So static, which I'm going to talk about now and we'll come back to it later in our code example. There's not really a good place for it yet because our code is pretty basic. Um, but let's talk about what it means. So static makes members and a member is an attribute or a method, right? The static keyword makes members belong to the class itself not specific instances or objects. So what does that mean? That means that for bosses, for example, if I were to make name static, now name does not belong to each boss individually. So every boss would not have its own name. Instead, all bosses would share the same name, right? So a static member means that it belongs to the class boss and all boss objects that I would create would share that data rather than a non-static attribute like we have here. Now each individual boss object I create has its own name because the static attribute is not present, right? So the use cases for static vary. There's some different things you could do. The most classic example is if I want methods or functions in my driver class, um, like where my main method would be, I'm not creating objects of my driver class, right? I'm, I'm not going anywhere and saying um, program P2 is a new program, right? You can do that, but odds are you're not gonna do that because this is the driver, this is where all of your logic happens. Why would you make objects of your driver, right? So any method I make here I know is not going to belong to an object, so I can just go ahead and make those methods static. So what we can say here is, um, I don't know, we could have a static void method called um, I don't even know what this method would do. We'll just have it be say hello. Right, So this method is static, meaning it belongs to the program class, not any specific object. And I can come up here and I could call, say, hello. Um, let's set her health to 50,000 just so that we don't get that exception again. And we see that my say hello method works. So all static means is that it belongs to the class, not a specific object. How can we use that with bosses? We will look at an example of that here in a little bit once we flesh out this boss class a little bit. So let's go back here to our example. So um, the best times to use static, um, the static keyword is when you have things like a constant um, attribute that all objects are gonna share, some kind of utility method that all objects will share, or if you want some kind of shared state between objects. Um, and we'll look at this last example is what we're gonna do with bosses, the shared state. Um, there's a lot of ways that you can write programs, right? So static is not even always necessary, but you may see it in the future and I wanted to make sure you knew what it was. So in this example, I have this utilities class um, that is a static class. And I have this method called add 
that is a static method. So what this means is I'm not making utilities objects anywhere. I would just say utilities.add when I want to use the method because add belongs to the whole class, not a specific object. So a couple more things we're gonna talk about. We're kind of jumping around with topics here. Um, another thing I wanted to mention in this video is I am doing this entire video using C Sharp because a lot of this stuff is either very sort of deeply buried in Python or it doesn't quite apply to how Python works. Um, so any code that you see or stuff here um, is pretty much um, we're going to sort of live in C Sharp for this topic or these topics today. Um, a, an exceptionally important topic that we're going to talk about a lot more in, in this class and in 1260 is the different types of data that we can deal with. And I want to talk about how those types of data interact with um, memory. So we have two main types of data, right? We have a value type and we have a reference type. And the names of these different types of data suggest what they store. So a value type will store actual values. And this is things like integers, floats, like our what we call primitive data types. Um, so ints, floats, booleans, etc. And we'll talk more about these here in a second. Um, but it's important to note that these types of data, value types, are stored on something called the stack in your memory on your computer. Um, we had the other type is a reference type, and these are things like objects. Those are stored on the heap in your memory. And we'll look at, at what, what these two types sort of suggest and also what the stack and the heap are here in a second. Um, but when we assign data to a value type variable, um, the data itself is copied, right? So if I say, let's go back to our code, for example. So if I say something like um, int x, right? And I say x is assigned 12. And then I come down here and say int y is assigned x. What is this saying? This is saying that y is assigned the actual data 12. Right, because x stores the actual data. Okay. Um, for the reference types, they're a little more complicated, right? A reference type variable does not copy the actual data, but it copies the memory address of the object in the heap. And we're going to look at what that means here in a second. So this one's a little more complicated than value types. Value types are very simple. That's why they're called primitive um, data types oftentimes. Um, reference types are a little more complicated, but if you understand what a reference is, it's really not too too bad. So let's look at the stack first. Um, and this is where our, um, our value type data is being stored, right? So the stack stores value types, and it also stores references. So if we were to have some magical ability to magic school bus our way into the RAM of our computer, and we could access... Um, the location of int x in my RAM. It would store, granted it's like a binary representation most likely, it would store the value 12 like I have in my program here, right? The value 12 is being stored here. Makes sense, right? Um, and it also stores what we call references to objects. So if I were to go here, for example, with my boss variable, what does boss contain? Right. If we were to look at this variable right here in memory, what does it contain? Well, we know its data type is an object of the boss class, but it doesn't contain a boss object in RAM. Instead, it contains a reference to the boss object. Well, where is this reference pointing me to? Think of a reference like a treasure map. Right? Boss contains a treasure map that will lead me to wherever this actual boss is in my computer's memory. Where is this boss? As we discussed a second ago, this boss is stored in the heap, right? And this is, you know, this is a little sort of complicated maybe, but um, bear with me. So stacks store value types, so like numbers and Booleans and stuff, as well as these references, which I'm referring to as like a treasure map, um, to objects. The stack, which we will talk a lot more about in the future, um, is, is 
applicable in a lot of different areas, but it operates in something called a last in first out manner or LIFO if you've seen this before. And literally think of this like a stack of cards. If you're playing Uno, um, the last card that's put on the top of the deck is the first one you take off or a stack of plates in your kitchen cabinet. The plate that you put in last is, unless you're a psycho, the one that you're taking off the top first, right? Some of the benefits or, or uh, traits of the stack, I guess, is there's very fast allocation and deallocation. So when I assign something to a variable and when I'm done with that variable, that process is very quick in terms of runtime and resources. And it's automatically managed by the computer whenever the scope of your variable ends. So whenever the variable dies because the method is over or the function is over, um, the deallocation of that resource in your RAM happens by itself. And again, some examples of things that are in the stack would be like ints, floats, booleans, and then like a reference to an object. The heap stores the object itself as well as reference type data, other kinds of reference type data. So like arrays, strings, stuff like that would be stored on the heap, as well as objects that we have created. Some traits about this, uh, memory allocation is a little bit slower than the stack as it involves garbage collection. So there's a lot of resources that are kind of spun up and spun down as these, as these objects and reference type data are created. Um, so when those die, as opposed to a primitive variable or a value type variable, the deallocation is very quick here with like an integer, for example, right? But for an object, that's a bit more complicated than just a simple number. So the allocation and deallocation and all of that takes a little bit longer. Um, the data will persist in the heap explicitly or until it is explicitly removed from the heap or some kind of garbage collection process is involved. A garbage collection is not like a meme or anything. This is um, a term that refers to how memory is managed. Um, and a lot of languages and, and platforms have built in garbage collection. C Sharp is one of those. Um, some of them do not, and you have to do it manually. Um, but it's important to kind of recognize like, okay, if I make an object it's not magically happening, right? Like that's kind of what I'm wanting to get at here. So when I create a new boss right here, and I think I might try to do this. Let's try to do this in picture form. I need a paint and let's paste this in. Oh, wow, okay. Um, all right, so when we make a new boss, right? What is stored? Um, give me red. What is stored in here? Don't like that pen. I'm not sure that works. So what's stored in the boss variable? Well, the boss variable contains a reference to the boss object. Okay. So what does that mean? It's easy for me to say that it contains a reference to the boss object. Um, but what that actually means is that it contains what we call a pointer um, that will point me to somewhere in memory on the heap. Here's my heap. I'll do it in picture format. Here's my heap in the memory, right? Somewhere on my heap, there is Melania. And I'm gonna try to draw her helmet. Oh, wow. This is great. There's the wings. There's the hair. Beautiful. So the boss variable over here, right, contains a reference to Melania. It's like a pointer, right? A treasure map that will take you to where she is in the heap. The heap itself is actually storing Melania, but my variable contains the reference to her. It'll, it'll tell me how to find her, right? Um, and that's kind of important to recognize. And so boss is storing the reference to Melania on the stack, whereas Melania herself, the boss object, is being stored in the heap. Hopefully that helps and was not 50,000 times more confusing. <laughs> 
Um, but I digress. All right, so let's let's keep talking about this stuff here. So, um, like I said, the data will persist until it is explicitly, and that means by us as the programmer, we have to go in and explicitly say, all right, I want you to delete this object out of the heap. Or some kind of garbage collection process happens. And again, that can either be manual or automatic. C Sharp, all of this is automated for you, so you don't have to worry about this. Um, but it is worth noting that if we were in a different language, um, one that did not automatically do this for you, we would have to sort of dig into that heap and delete things we didn't need anymore. But some examples, um, objects of a given class are stored here in the heap. Arrays would be stored in the heap. Strings, stuff like that um, is stored in the heap. And then the stack, like we said, contains value types like numbers and booleans and stuff, as well as these references that point me to the location in the heap. So some differences here between the two. Um, speed, the stack is faster and the heap is slower. Scope, um, a variable's scope, for example, is limited to the current method. We talked about that when we were talking about variables in Python. If I create a local variable in a function, that variable's scope is restricted to that function, right? Things that are in the heap are global until they are explicitly freed. Now, C Sharp kind of handles a lot of this for you with, with the scope of objects and such, um, but just sort of from the, I guess what I'll call the textbook or um, conceptual level, uh, things in the heap are global in scope until you remove them. The size on the stack would be smaller than the heap. Um, the data stored in the structure, um, the stack, like we said, contains value types and references, and the heap contains objects and other type of reference data. Memory handling, the stack is automatic. The heap garbage collection is required. Again, the caveat here of certain languages do this for you. Um, but like I said, conceptually, this is kind of the differences. So I have some code examples here of how these two structures kind of work. Um, so this one here, right, let's say I have this void method called process data. Um, I have int x, which is assigned a value of 10. And that value is stored on the stack. So um, it's on top of the stack, if you want to think of it that way. Then I create y, which is assigned whatever value x possesses. So what happens is I create a copy of that value and assign it to y. x doesn't really matter here. So if I were to change y to 20, x is still 10 and y is now 20, right? Because they're two different values. Where this becomes tricky is with how the heap works, right? So let's say that I have just some basic class called my class, and I have this function called process data. I create two objects, right? I have object one and I have object two. So let's look at what each of these objects contain. We know that they contain references, right? Object one contains a reference to a new my class object, and that object will be stored in the heap, and the reference would be stored on the stack. So what happens then when I make object two and I assign it the value that object one contains? Well, we know object one does not contain an actual object, right? It contains a reference. So what I'm saying is object two receives the same reference that object one contains. So if we wanna go back to our gorgeous paint example here, let's say that I create something down here called, um, we'll do this in blue. Let's say I have something here called boss. I'm doing this with my mouse, so please be forgiving. Boss two. And let's say that it's assigned whatever value is in our boss variable. And this is a semicolon, not a J. Okay. So what is happening here? Well, we know that boss contains a reference to the boss object. So what I'm saying here is assign that reference that boss contains to boss two. So now not only does boss point to Melania, boss two also points to Melania because they contain the same reference. 
right? So if you want to copy an object, there's different ways you can do that, but this is not it, right? Because all you're really doing is copying the reference, not the object itself. And this is probably a little confusing, but we will do more of this as we progress in your programming um, classes. I just want you to kind of start thinking about it now. So back in our example here, right, same as we just did with the bosses, object two contains a reference that matches the reference in object one. So if I change the value of object two, what I'm saying here is I'm changing the value of the object that object two references, right, to 20. Object two and object one both reference the same object. So if I decide to look at the value of object one now, because they both point to the same thing, object one is also 20, right? Because I did not actually copy the object itself, I just copied the reference. So who cares, right? Like this is maybe a little complicated, maybe you just don't wanna hear about it. Um, why does this matter, right? Um, well, this matters a, a great deal because if you are trying to deal with several objects and you don't quite understand how references work, um, you might end up overwriting an object that does not need to be overridden. You might end up copying content that doesn't need to be copied. Um, so understanding how references work um, is important. And you can't quite understand how references work until you sort of understand how what the stack and the heap are, at least at a very high level. Um, and again, we'll get more practice with this and stuff in the future, so don't feel like you have to walk away from this an expert. Um, just start thinking about it. So um, like this says, why does it matter? So value types, because value types are copied independently of the variable, like we saw here, right, I can copy the value of a value type variable like x and y, because they're both ints. We know that those are primitive or value type variables, I can just copy the, the data. I don't, I'm, not copy, I'm not dealing with references, right? All I'm doing is copying the numbers. So that's good um, for data integrity because I'm not at risk of accidentally messing up a reference or something, right? I mean, this is good for lightweight data like numbers or Booleans or whatever. Reference types, while it is more complicated, like this stuff with references and the heap and pointers and all of that is a little complicated, it is also much, much better to create objects for data that's more complex than a simple number or a true or false, right? We often want to represent things in a program that are a bit more, you know, complex or, or robust than just a number or a Boolean. So that's why we like objects, because they let us put in representations of things from real life into our programs in a way that is more simple than just ones and zeros, right? Um, but regardless, like we use objects and reference types for lots of things. We have arrays if we want to deal with collections. We have strings if we want to deal with text. We have objects if we want to represent, if we want to model something after real life, et cetera. Um, however, you just have to recognize that if you change something through a reference, anything that that, that other reference, sorry, if you change something, like an object on the heap, any reference that points to that object is affected, right? Like we saw here. We know that boss and boss2 both point to Melania. So what if I changed Melania to something else? What if I changed her HP, I updated her HP to one? Maybe I'm fighting Melania and I'm updating my program live. Her HP is now one. Well now, boss and boss2 are both affected by this change because they both point to that specific object in memory, right? This was important to recognize that. So to wrap this up, and then I'm gonna do a little bit more with our code. Um, and I'm gonna kind of bring some of this stuff into the code example that we have set up. Um, a backing field, which we saw with those private fields, right? That allows us to enable controlled access to private data through the use of a property, right? So we saw 
here, right? Name is private. We are controlling access to name through this property. Whoa, not what I wanted. Sorry about that. Uh, the static keyword allows us to have members, methods, attributes, etc., that are class level, not object level. And again, I'll show you an application of using static in code here in a minute. Um, we learned that value type data, things like ints and booleans and references, are stored on the stack. And then the reference data itself, so the object that the reference points to, um, or the array that the reference points to, or the string that the reference points to, those things are stored on the heap. So hopefully this was um, not too much information overload. Um, I, I do think that seeing these code examples will help a little bit here in a second. Um, I do have one thing that I want to talk about sort of in between, and that is um, something called UML. Um, and I will be right back with an application called Asta that lets us create UMLs. There's all kinds of UML software out there. Asta is just the one that I learned UMLs with, and it's been on my computer ever since. So I will be right back. Okay, welcome back. I have opened up Asta here, um, and I'm not going to ask you to create um, UMLs in 1250. We may kind of go into this a little more in 1260, um, but I do want to kind of show you, um, especially if you're more of a visual learner or you like diagrams or charts, um, stuff like the tables, that kind of thing, to help you visualize things. A uh, UML is essentially a visual language that we use in um, all kinds of areas, but with programming specifically, we can use UML to really show the components of our program prior to writing a single line of code. This is not totally dissimilar to our flowcharts that we did. However, the flowcharts really handle like the logic. Like, so here I'm going to do an if statement, and if this is true, then I'll do this. If it's false, I'll do this. Um, UML really shows me what are the pieces of my code? What are my variables? What are my methods? Um, and it kind of, you label everything out, you can put it in a nice visual format, and then you can take your diagram and you have a really solid, basically a skeleton for your code that you can sit down and create. Um, there's all kinds of things about UML that you can do. The one I want to show you today is what we call a class diagram. Um, and this is exactly what it sounds like, right? It's a diagram that shows me things about a class. So I want to do a class diagram for our boss class that I started earlier in the video. Um, and in my diagram, I'm going to highlight some things such as like what attributes is the boss going to have, right? We did name and HP, but what else might we want to keep track of? Um, what methods are we going to have? We're probably going to have a constructor, right? We talked about the init constructor in Python, and we talked about the constructor methods in C Sharp. Um, I'd like to have a constructor in there. I would like to demonstrate this um, static keyword somehow with you guys. Um, so all these things we can model out in a UML or in a class diagram to have a good starting point without even write, writing a line of code, right? This is all visual. Um, so this, like I said earlier, this program is called Asta. Um, this is the professional version of Asta, but there are free versions out there. If you like Draw.io, or I believe it's um, I believe it's called Diagrams.net now, um, you can do UML class diagrams in in that. Um, there's all kinds of software out there that you can do class diagrams in. There's even I haven't really played around with it very much, but within Visual Studio, um, you can create a class diagram, and Visual Studio will go ahead and create the code skeleton for you based off of the class diagram, which is pretty cool. Um, I don't really have, I haven't really messed around with that too much, but regardless, there's options here. You could draw it by hand if you wanted to. Um, really, it's just to help the programmer um, know where to start, right? It's not designed to be confusing or um, trip people up in any way. It really is kind of like a helpful um, instruction manual almost. Um, so I'm not going to spend too much time kind of going through how Asta works just in the sake of time if you're interested. Um, I would be happy to kind of show you in uh, in class sometime or um, do some kind of special session on Discord or something like that where we talk about Asta a little bit. 
But regardless, I do want to talk about sort of the layout of a UML or of a class diagram. I'm going to zoom in here. If you're curious, this package just represents my software package. So what, what is my project? Any classes within the project you would have inside this package square. Um, but we have a box here, right? A rectangle. The top represents the name of the class. So my, I'm doing this to represent the boss class. Um, the middle section here represents any attributes that I have. And that includes our backing fields. That includes our properties. Any kind of attribute that we want to deal with. And then the bottom box here includes any methods. So one of the nice things about Asta is I can click on the class. And over here, I can add in attributes or operations. Um, so these would be my properties. These would be my methods, um, et cetera. So the first thing I want to do is I'm going to add in an attribute. Um, and this is like what we call a UML notation. So we have a couple things to, to look at here. The first thing is this little symbol here to the left of the attribute name. If it is minus, that means that the attribute is private. If it is plus, that means the attribute is public. And there are a couple other ones, but I'm not going to get into that right now. So minus for private, plus for public. Uh, we then have the attribute's name. We have a colon. And then the data type of the attribute comes after that. So um, for this example, let's do, we had, what, HP? You know, we had name. Name was first. So my attribute is underscore name. And its data type is not an int, right? It is a string. So I want to try to find string here. And I'll change the data type to string. So now I know that the boss class has a private attribute. It is a string. And it is called name. All right, let's add our HP in. So I have underscore HP. That is also private. And I'm OK with that one being an int. I'll do one more. Um, and we'll call this. Um, We'll stick with Elden Ring bosses for now. If you've never played Elden Ring, uh, don't worry about it too much. We have name, we have the hit points, and we have runes, which is basically the experience. So how many runes does the boss drop? And I'm okay with that being an int as well. So these are my three backing fields. I now want to make sure that I have my properties um, reflected here as well. Um, so I will add a name with a capital N. That's how we do properties. It is a string. And this time, it is not private, but public. So you can see that the minus changed to a plus. And I want to do this for all three of my backing fields. So I'll have HP. And I will have runes. OK. So we see that in our UML, or like I said, the top little section of this box is the name of the class. This middle one is my attributes. And this bottom one is my methods. So let's add a method here. Um, and Asta calls them operations. Som sometimes they'll be called functions. But um, Asta is kind of language agnostic. So um, not every language calls them methods. So that's why it says operation. So here I will add. I want to do this for the constructor, right? So remember in, in C Sharp, the constructor shares the name of the class. So the name of this method is boss. And remember, constructors also don't return anything. So I'm going to actually just remove the return type altogether here. Um, so now just looking at this, I can see, OK, boss, this is a constructor. There's no parameters here, which I don't really like. I want to add three parameters. So the first parameter I want to add is the name. And I'll just call this name like this. It is a string. And notice how we're kind of sticking to this UML language of the name of the thing, colon, and then the data type of the thing. All right? And we'll look at how this is useful or why we care here in a second. Um, oops. So I'm going to click on the boss uh, constructor here. I'm going to add two more parameters. The second one is the HP. And the third one is the runes. So now we have a pretty decent starting point, right? I'm going to go back over here to my program. I'm actually going to delete all of the code that I wrote earlier in the video. Um, let's do this. 
Visual Studio really wants me to do a special, special comments. Um, but let's go ahead and just remove these things right here. So in your assignment for, for this topic, I'm going to provide to you a UML class diagram that is, is designed to help you. It's designed to help, right? So I don't have any code for a boss yet. I don't know what I really need. Well, that's what UML gives us, right? I can see that I have three private things. I have name, HP, and runes. Name is a string. HP is an int, and runes is also an int. So we can go to our code. I have three private things, so they're probably going to be my backing fields. So I have private string name, private int HP, and private int runes. All of those pulled from here, right? These first three items. The second three will be my um, my properties. I'm going to leave these as default properties for now. Um, so public string name. HP and runes, and we'll do this. We'll do this the robust way here. Um, you can do this on one line if you want. If if that kind of bothers you, you can separate it out into separate lines. I'm I'm kind of a one line kind of person when I can get away with it. Um, as long as you have the appropriate curly brace, then you're fine. So we'll be a little explicit here, um, not quite the default implementation, because again, if you wanted to do this fully default, um, you would do something like this. We would say like public int runes, get, set, and just move on, because this creates this backing field automatically for you. Um, but when we explicitly create these, it kind of wants us to be a little more specific with how the code works. Um, but either way is fine. I'm just going to show you the more explicit way right now. All right, so I've got my backing fields. These three items are properties. So I want to move those down here. And we can see that I have you know, this middle section of the UML um, finished, right? So I've got my three fields. I've got my three properties. Now all I really have to do is my um, constructor. And we see that it is a public constructor because it has the same name as the class. Right? That's how you know something's a constructor. And I've got three parameters. I've got name, HP, and runes, um, string, int, and int for their respective data types. So down here I can say constructors. If you are a keyboard shortcut person, C-T-O-R is the keyboard shortcut for a constructor. You can hit tab and that will kind of give you the skeleton of a constructor here. Um, so we can do string name, int HP, and int runes. And now we want to set these private fields equal to these values, right? So we can say if you want to keep it Pythonic, right, where we said self.name, um, we could use the this keyword. Um, but it is kind of unnecessary right now. If you adhere to the naming convention of underscore name, right, because they're different looking. If they were the same value, you would want to use the this keyword. So. But let's just do this constructor, right? So whatever I provide when I create a boss, that's what I want to set those fields to. And I think this is good for now, right? We'll leave it kind of simple. Um, let's go back to our program and let's create a boss. So remember, anytime we do this new boss, the constructor is called. So I don't have a constructor that's empty right now, so it's giving me an error. I mean, if I look at this error, it's going to say, hey, there isn't any arguments that match the parameters that I'm looking for, right? I'm expecting a string and two ints, and I have nothing. So that's why it's giving me this little red underline. So we'll do Melania, goddess of rot. We'll do her HP, whoops, which I had copied from Wikipedia, because I can, I'm sure some of y'all would come after me for getting it wrong. So. Goddess of Rod is specifically her second phase, so we'll go with that. 
Not that it really matters. Um, so that's the HP that she has. And then the runes that she drops. If we come over here, we see that she drops 480,000 runes. So we can say 480,000. Cool, so now we've used this UML as like a starting point to basically just write out the whole class, right? Um, the only thing that it doesn't do for us is the logic behind how the methods actually work. So um, it is a good place for kind of giving yourself a, a template or a skeleton to jump off with, but you do actually you know, have to kind of figure out how do these methods work. Um, let's see, what can we do next? Okay, so I think the example that I want to do for static um, is, and you can use this almost verbatim for your assignment this week, is let's say that I'm creating these bosses, right? And I want each boss to have an ID. Okay, so I could create a non-static ID field and property and manually set the ID of that boss, right? And I think what I would like to do instead is somehow utilize the static um, property of programming to dynamically create these IDs so I don't have to make it myself every time I make a boss. It's like, okay, Melania has an ID of one. Such and such boss has an ID of two. I would like the program to do that for me, and I don't have to worry about it, right? And we can, there's a lot of ways you could do that, but one of the ways is we could use static, um, like we said here in our slides, to maintain the um, state between our objects, right? So let's look at how we could do that. Um, the first thing I want to do is I want to update my class diagram. So I'm going to add a um, attribute here called ID, and I'm going to do a backing field and a property, probably not super necessary to do both, but we'll do it just for thorough, thoroughness' sake. And then I'll add an ID property, and this will be public. So here we will open that up. So now I have one extra field and one extra property. So let's go ahead and update our code really quick to reflect that change. Um, so we have a private integer field called ID, and we have a public integer field or public property um, that will why won't Visual Studio do it for me? This sucks. Now, one of the things we talked about on the slides was expanding the logic of these, which we might do here in a second. Like, I don't want uh, a name that's empty, for example, or I don't want any HP or runes that are zero or less, something like that. Um, we can add that in here in a little bit. Um, but for now, we're going to keep it very basic. So I've got these IDs, and as my program stands, right, I want to update my constructor probably um, to have an ID in here. And I could say that I set the ID, but now I've got to manually go in and put a number here. And like, is that the end of the world for this little program? No. But could we utilize a topic that we talked about with, with static to have this happen um, sort of dynamically? And the answer to that, I think, is yes. And there's a few ways we can do it. Um, one of the ways is I want to have a variable or an attribute that all of my bosses can reference. Um, I don't think anything outside of the boss class or the boss family of objects needs to look at this val value. So I think it can be private, um, but it won't really be a backing field necessarily. So I don't think I'm going to use the underscore um, syntax for it. Um, but I will because that's kind of the typical, if something's a private field, you use an underscore. So we'll, we'll use that. But we just want to make a note that it's not a backing field. So I'm going to come down here and I'm going to say, we'll call this like ID count, something like that. And I would like to move this up here. And one thing I want to do is I want to add a note to my um, 
to my UML. I want to add a note that says ID count is not a backing field. Again, like this is probably a little bit more than we really need to do, probably a little extra for what we need to do for this project or this, this example, but it is kind of nice to um, see that we can be specific and kind of visual about this. So um, ID count is not a backing field, and in fact, it is static. Um, so how can we mark that as static here in Asta? Well, we can click on the field itself, and I have the option to mark it as static, and it's false by default. But if I set it to true, we can see that it underlines um, the field. And anything underlined in the UML language signifies that it is static. Okay. So let's come over here and we'll go back to our code. And I'm going to come up here and say, these are my static fields. And I only have one, so I'll just say static field. Private static int id count. Okay, so now I have this, this thing here, and let's give it a default value of 1,000. Let's say that all my bosses will start with the ID of 1,000. So now instead of having to manually say what the ID of the boss is, I can use this ID count static field here, right, to set the ID of the boss. Now the problem with how this is set up right now is ID will always be a thousand, right, because we don't have a way to change the value of this static field. So we need a way to change this so that all of my bosses don't have the same ID, right, because if I save this code here, let's make a second boss. We'll do millennia for both for now. Well, no, let's just unnecessary confusion. Um, let's go back here. Can I pick a random boss somehow? Um, yeah, we'll do this. So Star Scourge Radon, that will be our second boss that we represent. So Star Scourge, 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 Radon. He drops 70,000 runes, according to Wikipedia. And he has how much HP? He has 9,572 HP. OK, so if I wanted to print out, um, oops, I'm not in Python anymore. If I wanted to print out, um, let's print out the name of the first boss and their ID as well. Um, right, and again, just to kind of recap, we are using these properties to access the value of these backing fields. We've got a little extra here because we're not doing anything custom to change the default implementation, but that's okay. Um, the the premise stands, right? I'm using the name property to get the value of the name field. And I want to do this for both bosses. If you're a keyboard person, control D will duplicate a line. I like to give out keyboard shortcuts. So we should see Melania and Radon both have the same ID, right? That's kind of what we're expecting to happen because we never change the ID. And we see that they both have an ID of 1000. Right, so we need a way in our program to dynamically update that every time we create a new boss. Okay. So every time we create a new boss makes me think the constructor, right? Every time the constructor happens, I need some action to occur that makes this go up by one. And there's a few ways we can do that. I'm going to write a method down here, or I'm going to need a method. Um, that will allow that to happen. So in our diagram, I want to add a new method down here. 
called increase boss ID count. Okay. Long name, but descriptive enough, right? Um, and what this will kind of let us do, we could do a couple, of, do this a couple of different ways. Um, let's actually change this. Let's call this get um, update boss ID count. We just keep it the same, I guess. Um, it does need to return a number. I think um, it doesn't. I don't think I want it to be void. I think I want it to return an int. It doesn't have any parameters, but it is static, right? Because all the bosses are going to use this method and this field. And they're going to share them to simulate some kind of state between all the bosses. So we will mark this method as true. We can see that it updates to um, the underline to signify that it's static. I also don't think this method really needs to be public, so I'm going to go ahead and make it private. Not the end of the world if it was public, but I'm never using this outside of the boss class, so I don't see a need to make it public. So let's go back over here and let's add this method. So we know we're going to have a private static method called update boss ID count. It is going to return an int. And all this is really going to do is I want it to return this but I want this to go up by one after that happens, right? So there's a couple ways you could do that. We could say um, boss ID count plus one. We'll, we'll do it even more specifically. So ID count is assigned whatever it had in it plus one. We could shorten this down a little bit to say plus equals one. We could shorten it even more and say plus plus. So this is me saying update ID count by adding one to it. Right? And then we could return ID count. So now all the bosses, because they share this static field, um, every time I create a boss, I want to call this method. So instead of me setting this like I have here, I'm going to set it to whatever this method returns. And because this method and this value are shared by the boss class, meaning all bosses share them, each boss will have a unique ID. I like even shorter lines of code, so I'm going to show you how we could shorten this even more, but this is totally fine. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with this. Um, I just like to make code as short as possible. So one way we could make this shorter is I could um, simply return I count ID count plus plus. We could also make this even shorter with some sort of shorthand um, like this. So again, I'm not requiring that you do this, but if you like to make things short, this basically means this method returns this value. I will not leave it this short for your all's reference, though. I might just have it be on one line because it is so short. But now if we were to go back to our driver program, Melania should have an ID of 1001, and Radon should have an ID of 1002. Or I'm sorry, yes, we start on 1000. Um, so what happens with our code is we return the ID count, whatever it is, so it starts at 1000, and then we add one to it after it's after it's been returned. So. Um, we will stay on 1000 and then Radon would be 1001. But through the simple use of a static field, right, we have the capability of sort of dynamically generating this ID. Now, is this the best or most common way to do something like this? Probably not. You would probably do handle that, you know, in your driver somewhere with some kind of counter variable and just increment it. But 
just to show you that you can use static um, attributes and methods to kind of make this thing happen. And in our UML, we can. I wanted to show you what static looks like here. It is under, underlined. Let's you know that something is static. Also, about to lose it because this is not a straight line. Um, still looks very wrong to me. Whatever. Um, the underlines signify that they're static, right? Remember, the things I want you to take away from UML, again, uh, you'll have a lot of practice making these later. Uh, I just want you to know how to kind of read it. So the middle box here is your, your attributes. Um, these private attributes are signified as private by the minus sign. The public attributes are signified as public by the plus sign. And then anything static is underlined. And then the UML language of like the name, colon, the type um, is sort of how this looks. And Asta is kind of nice about handling a lot of this for you. But like if you were to write this out yourself and kind of manually do it, um, I would recommend that you kind of look up the Asta or the UML sort of format for class diagrams because it'll take you some practice until I until we get to that in class when I make you start making these. But regardless, um, the last thing I kind of want to talk about is something that um, we will discuss more in depth in 1260, but it is the concept of a two-string method. Um, and Python has this as well. It looks like um, this in Python, um, the repr or representation method. Um, in C Sharp, though, we call this a two-string method. And what this allows us to do is instead of me like hard coding what's being printed out here about the bosses, I can, within a class, write a method that allows me to print an object out as though it were a string, hence the to string. Right? I'm basically saying, what does a boss look like when I display it as a string? Um, and we'll talk about what override and stuff means in 1260, but if you want to have two strings, and on your assignment I have you do a two string, but I give you the, the skeleton code for it. Um, this is kind of what that would look like. So we're going to ignore this override for now. Just know that two string exists in C sharp, and you need to override how it works. Um, but basically what we're saying here is two string is a special method that I am changing or overriding its functionality to be specific to a video game boss. And instead of returning like nothing, right? Let's look at what the default to string does first for a second. Um, so I'm going to do a new line and then I'm just going to show boss dot to string. So what does this look like when I print it out? And what it does is it displays the type of object that boss is. Um, so we see that it is a classes objects video game demo. That's my namespace dot boss, right? I don't like this. I want to change what a boss looks like as a string um, to look more like this um, or something useful for output purposes. So we can change how two string works by default, hence the override, um, and just change what it returns, right? So there's a few ways you can do this. I like to build the string before I return it. So what I like to do is um, create some kind of empty string and then just kind of build upon it. So what is what is this boss going to look like? Well, um, I think I want to show the bosses in some kind of like table format. So I would say boss string. I'll actually show you a different way to do this. Um, if you do three equal signs in C sharp, that allows you to do a multi-line string um, within the code. Um, so I just want to return whatever string I write here. All right, so I know I'm gonna have the um, ID of the boss. 
and I just want to show the ID. I know that I'm going to have the name of the boss. Show me the name. I know I want to have the HP and the runes. And then if you're neurotic like me, you can line all this up so that it um, looks pretty. So now because I have returned a specific string that represents how I want a boss to look as a string, let's rerun our program and see what's changed. Well, here now we see that this looks a lot nicer, right? I have um, each of my attributes on separate lines. Um, and I can deal with this output a lot prettier. So we could say, instead of this output that we have up here, right? I could say, give me both of my bosses as strings. Maybe I want some kind of a separator here. Um, I could add a little separator in the middle. Um, but here we see that now this two string method has allowed me to return these boss objects as sort of text representation. All right. Uh, a little bit of extra stuff that we could do if you wanted to. Um, this is a, a way that we can format our, our um, numbers for like HP and runes. This will give me commas with no decimal places. So just for our output's sake, I can put some commas in there for HP and runes. ID doesn't really need it because it's not, you know, a number that I want commas on. Um, but like the health and the runes, maybe I want to keep track of like easily no like oh, 70,000 um, just by having the comma there. Regardless, um, this is pretty much uh, what I wanted to show you here. Um, this code example I will put up on D2L for you all to access um, and play around with. Um, pretty basic example of um, some of the stuff we talked about in our uh, earlier in the video. A um, couple things that are kind of missing from this that if you wanted to sort of practice and play around with is how could you deal with collections of bosses? Like if you wanted to add, you know, let's say 10 bosses to a list um, or an array, um, could you figure out how to add all of them to a list and then for every item in the list do some stuff with them for sure like that's definitely possible um but i think this this kind of covers what i wanted to talk about from earlier in the video so we have our backing fields um, and just for one more final recap uh, my backing fields contain the data itself right the properties control access to that data um, and this one here the static field um, all of my bosses are going to share this. Um, so if I create 100 bosses, the ID will be 1,100, right, for the last boss. Um, because they all share it, because it's static, right? It doesn't belong to a specific one boss. It belongs to all of them, because it belongs to the class. Uh, my constructor, remember that shares the name of the class, and this says how a, how a boss is created. Like when I come over here and I say new boss, what happens? when I write that code. Well, this is what happens, right? The ID of that boss is set to some number that this static method returns. The name is set to whatever name I provide when I create the boss. So is the HP and the runes. Um, and then the two string, um, again, this just kind of represents the boss as a string and not as a, um, just that kind of standard, um, object type that C sharp kind of does by default. And then over here in our driver, you know, we have, we've made two bosses and then I'm just showing you um, how to write those bosses out. One little last fun fact for you. Um, two string, like I mentioned earlier, is a special method in C sharp. Um, so technically speaking, if boss references an object that has a two string method in it, I don't have to put two string and it will still have the same functionality. It's kind of uh, smart enough to recognize like if you're printing a boss and two string is there, um, it will use the two string method automatically. So 
Um, that's just a little fun fact for you. I'm going to leave it there just for, for clarity's sake, but um, if you were curious. Um, but thank you for watching this video. Um, keep your eyes open for the assignment that is out there. Um, you'll have uh, a couple weeks to work on it. And um, next time we meet, um, I'll kind of discuss any questions you all had on the video and um, we'll review for our final exam. Hope you all have a good Thanksgiving if you watched this before Thanksgiving. And if it's after Thanksgiving, I hope you had a great time. Um, and if you didn't celebrate, I hope you had a good break. See you next time.